some people were very hesitant to give their family recipes. They were prized and yeah. they would not give them out to people. And also, even with the restaurants, a lot of those recipes had never been given out publicly before. I do think that, that that's kind of interesting now. I'm Robin Sessingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and southern charm. The Zest celebrates cuisine and community in the Sunshine State. This week, we're living the sweet life. We'll visit with the Junior League of Tampa to test out a peach cobbler recipe from the Gasparilla Cookbook. We talk to the authors of the New Pie Cookbook about ideas for updating that classic dessert. And edible cookie dough arrives in Tampa. Stay with us for your just desserts. The Junior League of Tampa first published its Gasparilla Cookbook in 1961. Back then, most of its members were young, stay-at-home moms and the wives of prominent civic leaders. Today, the Junior League of Tampa has more than 2,000 volunteers, and most of its members work outside the home. But some things haven't changed, like the Junior League's role in helping the community and the Gasparilla Cookbook. Back in the 60s, sales from the early editions of the Gasparilla Cookbook helped pay for construction of the Junior League of Tampa's waterfront headquarters on Davis Islands. The book is still a must-have gift for bridal showers or for welcoming a newcomer to town. It's also a window into the cultural and culinary history of Tampa, and the recipes its authors contributed more than a half century ago have stood the test of time with a little tweaking, especially its classic desserts. Cookbook Chair Morgan Novo talked me through making Mrs. Julian B. Lane's Prize Peach Cobbler. All right, so when I started putting this together, it calls for us to start by prepping essentially the batter that goes into it. And so just combining the flour, the salt, the baking powder, and then adding with it the sugar and then the milk, whisking that all together and um, then you want to take an eight by eight baking dish and melt the butter in the bottom of that Um, and I just sliced up the butter I actually I made this recipe a little earlier in the week just to try it out first and I thought it was a little too heavy on the butter so I did cut back this time and once that butter is melted in the bottom, it'll be pretty evenly dispersed and you're gonna pour that batter on top of it. Yeah, that's what I like about this recipe. Now I go ahead and use the whole half stick of butter, Yeah. but then you don't have to worry about it too much. You just pour the batter, it's, it's thin, it's liquidy, right. pour it over the butter, and then you just dump your peaches on top of that. Yeah, and- It's not fussy. I added, Um, almost about a cup of extra peaches. It calls for two cups of peaches. And the first time I made it, I thought the batter was a little too thick compared to the amount of peaches. So um, I added an extra cup of peaches to mine and kept the sugar amount the same. Um, And when I mixed it, just dump them in on top of that batter. But I arranged them in a way just to make sure pretty evenly dispersed in there. Okay, so I did the same thing as you. I -hmm. I upped the peaches. I I don't think you can have too many peaches. I agree, I thought about doing more. (laughs) Yeah, as many peaches as you can do without getting sick of cutting up peaches. Right. It's not gonna hurt it to have too many peaches. And you're right, I think as it was written, it's too much cobbler to peach. It's too much batter to peach. So you want to put more peaches in there, I did cut back. It calls for a cup of sugar in the peaches Mm -hmm. and a cup of sugar in the batter. Mm -hmm. I left the sugar in the batter. I cut the sugar in the peaches, though, to just a half a cup, quarter cup. I I agree. I think you could easily do that. Um, Even when I was mixing it with the extra peaches in there, it was almost hard to mix all of the sugar because they felt fully coated even, you know, with the the extra peaches added in there. So I think you could, that's a place you could easily add it back. So you bake that 
for an hour at 350, it's just, it's really, you can't go wrong. You can't. It, it's a no fuss recipe. It's a crowd pleaser. I feel like everyone loves fruit. Everyone loves a cobbler. It's, you know, got your carbs, got your fruit. It's, it's a crowd pleaser. <laughs> you can eat it. You can eat it hot with some ice cream, with some vanilla ice cream. You can eat it cold in the morning for breakfast. And my husband has been caught multiple times this week on my sample version of this eating that cold. So yeah, it's I agree. <laughs> so I was going through this book with my, with my parents and we, we were having fun looking at the names of who gave the recipes. And I said, because, you know, this was sort of a little bit before my time. This, this cookbook was from 1961. But my parents know a lot of these names. So I said, well, this peach cobbler is Mrs. Julian Lane. And my father said, that was the mayor of Tampa, Julian Lane. And I looked it up. He was the mayor from 1959 to 1963. And he is credited with desegregating Tampa. The story was that the students were trying to, the black students were trying to sit in at the Woolworths, which was the segregated um, counter. And he negotiated with the Woolworths and townspeople and the students and was able to just kind of like do this in a peaceful fashion and, you know, make the change, but make it in a way that kept the peace. So good guy, good mayor. That is uh, Julian Lane. And that's who, that's Mrs. Julian Lane, is the, uh, is the author of the prize peach cobbler. So that's some of the fun of this, isn't it, Morgan, to see the history that goes behind these names? Absolutely. This cookbook is really special because it has a lot of stories embedded in it. But if you dig a little deeper, like you did with um, the, the author of this recipe, you can find even more history and certainly learn a lot more about Tampa um, than you knew before. And you know, it, it's just really special to the Junior League, but I think that this cookbook has also become really special to Tampa. Yeah. Some of the other Junior League locations are still in a growth mode, whereas the Junior League of Tampa is such a well-established organization with ties throughout the entire community that um, it's when you say that you're a member and a volunteer, it's really well respected. I think we need to taste it. I think we do too. <laughs> okay. So is this, is this hot? It's probably warm at this uh -huh. point. Okay. Um, and I think you could serve it either way, I think. Oh, so this is a, what, a, like a 10 by 10? This is an eight by eight. This is eight by eight. It looks like the perfect size. Yeah, it for, calls for an eight by eight actually in the recipe. So I tried to stick to that just to make kind of portion wise, it looks good. Now something funny about the eight by eight is it says it serves six people. And <laughs> I'm looking at this and I think it could serve six hungry people, but <laughs> I, I think you could get a little more bang for your buck than six. <laughs> Oh, I was thinking four people. Yes. It's funny. I thought four people because, yeah. That's, now, I'm kind really of good. digging in through the center because of that butter that creeps up through the sides. Now, maybe I'll serve you some of the extra butter because you said you like that. <laughs> but when, That bothers you. <laughs> I don't know why. I didn't. That wasn't my favorite part of it. You know, well, tastes change, and this is from the 60s. It is, yeah. Well, and a lot of these recipes were handed down much, you know, from much longer ago than the 60s. So um, a lot of the things that you see referenced in the, in the cookbook, I mean, they could be recipes that families passed down for many more generations than that. Some people were very hesitant to give their family recipes. They were prized and yeah. they would not give them out to people. And also, even with the restaurants, a lot of those recipes had never been given out publicly before. And the Greek salad, I know for sure, and some of the ones from Valencia Gardens and the Columbia, those had been their family recipes as well as some of the individuals. I do know of one person who would not give her recipe out, and it had to do with the meringue, doing like a pavlova thing, would not give it out because it had been in her family for three generations, and she didn't want other people to know how to make it. <laughs> so, you know, um, 
I, I do think that, that that's kind of interesting now. Uh, well, the, the re Col Columbia restaurant was really generous with how many recipes. They were. And you know, I have to say that we had a wonderful, wonderful food editor in Tampa at the time that this cookbook came around. Her name was Ann McDuffie. And she had weekly food columns. And she did so much to help promote the Gasparilla cookbook with recipes, pictures, um, she really did. She, and, and also, during that time, other junior leagues started saying, look, if Tampa can do this and make you know, such a success out of their cookbook, we ought to try it too. So I know Nashville was one of the cities, and um, I, there are a lot of other junior leagues around the country that have cookbooks because they admired this one. It all started with this one. And you said, what was the, Southern Living gave it an honor? They featured the Gasparilla Cookbook in their Cookbook Hall of Fame, yes. so. So it's time to try this. All right, dig in. I got a little ice cream, I got a little batter, I gotta make sure I get some peaches. It's good. All right, I'm glad I have your approval on first taste. <laughs> What do you think? I like it. And the thing I love about a cobbler is it's got the different consistencies to it. So you've got a little bit of the chewy, crunchy in the, in the cobbler crust. I love adding the ice cream on top. I prefer that over a whipped topping just because I like the cold with the warm. I think because there's so much sugar in that, in that um, batter, mm -hmm. it caramelizes really beautifully. And it does give you that kind of a uh, tougher, crunchy top to it. And I, like you said, I think you can't add too many. You know, this was my second go at it this week, and um, I think if I did it a third time, I would maybe go up to four cups of peaches <laughs> and oh, just yeah. totally double You can't it. do mm -hmm. too many. But I think because of the, there is a lot of batter, it's a, I think that's why I say breakfast. It puts you in mind of breakfast food. Yeah, it's, it's in the same roles with danishes and kind of that family. You've got the sweetness and the fruity. Um, I think it'd be great for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And obviously my husband approves. <laughs> Thank you so much, Morgan. Thanks you're, for being with us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. That was Morgan Novo, this year's cookbook chair. And we also heard from Laura Hulse who was the cookbook chair of the Junior League in the early 1970s. Our thanks to the Junior League of Tampa for sharing the recipe for prize peach cobbler from the Gasparilla Cookbook. You can find that recipe on our website, thezestpodcast.com. If you're looking to bake a better pie, Chris Taylor and Paul Arguin have the prescription. The couple are doctors by day, but when they're not on call, the self-taught bakers trade their white coats for aprons. Over the years, they've racked up more than 500 baking ribbons, including Amateur Best in Show for their checkerboard peanut butter pie at the 2017 National Pie Championships in Orlando. Chris and Paul recently spoke to our contributor, Janet Keeler, from their home in Atlanta. Their cookbook is called The New Pie, Modern Techniques for the Classic American Dessert. Hello, Chris. Hello, Paul. Good morning. Hello. Hello. So I first have to just do a little gushing about the, uh, the New Pie, Modern Techniques for the Classic American Dessert. This is one yummy cookbook. I know you've won like 500 awards for your baking, and I guess the... The big one was the best of show in the amateur division at the 2017 National Pie Championship in Orlando. I was just completely floored. I mean, because it was there's always such great competition. You know, we really get to know the competitors over the years, um, and so just to be you know considered to be one of you know the best pie makers in America was really an incredible experience. That's you're. This is Chris talking, right? You right. What was the pie? The peanut butter checkerboard, which is in the book. Oh, it is. I saw that one. I was drooling over that. And that's so, so, <laughs> so pretty looking. So you you both are doctors with the, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, correct? That's correct, yes. yes. So I have to say there's a sense of precision in this cookbook that I might expect from from some doctors. Your, your uh, directions are super clear, but you've also got a lot of great little uh, asides here, great stories about the, the recipes. So talk a little bit about the inspiration for some of the recipes. Sure. 
for for some of the more uh, traditional pies, like the apple, um, it's not uh, traditionally made. So uh, uh, the the traditional pies have been made um, using uh, new modern techniques. The apple, in particular, we use uh, uh, sous vide technology. So uh, the apples are uh, put in a vacuum sealed bag, um, cooked to a precise temperature in an immersion circulator, a water bath. And what that allows you to do is cook the fruits, and we do that with, with several different fruits, to the absolute perfect um, uh, amount. Uh, you know, if you're cooking out, say, an apple on a stovetop, um, it'll go from a raw apple towards mush. And, mm-hmm. and you want to you want to stop at some point where it's just tender, uh, it'll maintain its shape and have that perfectly cooked flavor. And sous vide cooking allows you to do that. So, you know, we've, we've incorporated some new technologies to make some of these traditional flavors. But then also, the rest of the book includes um, fun and interesting flavors that you haven't seen before in pie. Flavors like root beer float. Mm-hmm. We have a mint chocolate chip. We have um, one that's made with um, fruity breakfast cereal, like fruity pebbles and tricks and Fruit Loops. Uh, we have a bubble gum pie. Um, you know, and then you know, just some great combinations of classic ones. So a blueberry pie, but it has banana in it. A German chocolate pecan pie, so you get your classic pecan pie, but also some chocolate and some coconut added. Um, so we really tried to incorporate a lot into it because we wanted to make something that was, you know, that you know, pie sort of has a a nostalgic feeling to it. You know, it's a classic American dessert, but we didn't want to do a classic American pie cookbook. We really wanted to put our own spin on it. But, you know, I, and that comes through so strongly, I think, you know, when I was looking through a lot of the recipes, like a, the Pittsburgh Proud one really, really <laughs> um, stuck out to me. So talk a little bit about that pie. Um, well, I, um, I grew up outside of Pittsburgh, and I went to college and graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh. And so I, um, one of the, the things about Pittsburgh is if you were to, you know, if you were to order a sub, like a sandwich at a restaurant that was billed as being California style, you know it has, you know, avocado on it. It's similar in Pittsburgh. If you order a sandwich or a salad that's Pittsburgh style, it's going to come with French fries on it. And that's not maybe a widely known <laughs> sort of culinary thing. Um, but we wanted to do an ode to the, the Pittsburgh style food. And so this is a, a chocolate pie that um, is made. Uh, we boil down some Yingling Porter beer and Yingling is a beer brewed in Pittsburgh. It's, it's America's um, oldest brewery. And then we top it with chocolate-covered potato sticks, with the potato sticks sort of being our ode to the French fry. So it's, it's great, this deep chocolate, a little bit malty chocolate filling with these salty, crispy potato sticks on top. It's a really great flavor. There's a certain amount of... Um... I wouldn't say you have to necessarily be an experienced cook or an experienced baker to to tackle these recipes, but you certainly have to be willing to put in some time, don't you think, and do some practicing and experimenting a little bit. Well, uh, it's one of the things we did include in the book. At the top of every recipe, there's a little star rating system for both uh, ingredients, construction, um, and um, and the equipment that that are, are needed. And so there's definitely some more accessible pies that are going to be one-star recipes that um, maybe the, the less experienced baker might want to start with, um, some of the, the, the simpler recipes. And then as you're ready for more of a challenge, yeah, this, you have know, some of the more complicated ones. But I will say even probably the most complicated recipe in the book, you're right. It's, it's not that it's, it's going to be hard to do, but it, it might be more time consuming and you just need to be a little methodical as, as you go through the steps. Well, yeah, I like that. I love that star rating. I thought that was I thought that was really helpful. Um, so let let me ask you this. Okay, here's the great debate. I want you to talk about in baking. Uh, are we are we weighing ingredients? Are we measuring ingredients? You talk a little bit about uh, about that in the book, but uh, explain that why why you think it's better one way or the other. We are we are firm advocates for weighing ingredients. There's a couple reasons. One is it's it's more accurate, um, especially in, with things like. Uh, flour. You know, if you weigh flour, if you scoop it into your cup, you could get a five ounce cup. If you spoon flour into a measuring cup, you could get a cup that only weighs four and a quarter ounces. You know, that could be, you know, a a 25% difference, you know, depending on the weight. And if you're doing something like uh, pie crust, where the amount of flour to the amount of water really makes a difference, you really want to be sure that you're accurate with your flour measurement to really make the, the perfect pie crust. Um, and, and so in the book, we give um, weights for ounces and grams. Um, we also do provide volume measurements because we know there are some people um, that are resistant to weighing either because they <laughs> don't like the practice 
or they don't have a scale, um, you know, it's just custom for them. Um, but we really think the accuracy of weighing ingredients, especially for baking, is paramount. It also makes for easier cleanup. If you can measure your ingredients into a bowl directly, especially for something like molasses, you don't, you don't have to worry about scraping out a sticky measuring cup. You're, you're you know, dirtying all these measuring cups that you then have to clean later. Um, especially if you, you know, some of the pies have, you know, multiple components. So just measuring everything all at once, it, it goes so much faster. Yeah, and I'd say for pie crust in particular, because that's one of those things that if, if you talk with anyone who you know, says, you know, I'm afraid of making pie, they always come right to the pie crust. They say, my pie crust never works out, or I have these issues with adding a little too much water, and then you're always adding a little bit you know, more flour. Or, and I think to, to, to switch from the, the volume measures to the weights, uh, if, if, if they haven't done it before, people will find a world of difference. To, you, know, if you can follow these precise weight measurements uh, and you have a much higher chance of having a, a good pie crust. Yeah, that's, and that's super important because I think that's why some of us sometimes shy away from pies because the crust seems sort of problematic. Um, how about some of these boozy not... ones? Talk to me about these cocktail pies. Mm, they look good. Sure. The cocktail pies... Um, they are, it, that is such a, um, a, a rich place to look for, for flavor inspirations. Is in, uh, there's such, been such a, a boom in the cocktail industry in the past uh, couple of years. Every, every restaurant you go to has um, um, uh, fun and interesting cocktails on, on their menu all the time. So you know, we, we did a couple um, of the classic cocktails, things like a, a strawberry margarita, mm-hmm. uh, an old-fashioned, um, a, a Manhattan, um, a Bellini. Um, you know, all of these uh, uh, cocktails that uh, we actually do include both the uh, the flavors as well as uh, actual booze. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so for, yeah, for some of them, uh, they pack a little bit of a punch. That mango colada is on my list to make for sure. Um, as you were going through this and over the years that you've been baking together, any, any ideas uh, uh, get left on the cutting room floor? All the time, day after day, um, we keep um, running lists of sort of um, flavor ideas or pie innovation ideas. And so, you know, we we went to that list um, when we got the contract to do the book. And so, you know, obviously we had sort of a catalog of some award-winning recipes that we could Mm. draw from. But also we had a list of ideas going, oh, well, this really doesn't fit into the categories for the National Pie Championship, but we still think this would be a great idea. So the book was a great chance to go back to that list and pull those and start really testing them and say, oh, you know, this mango colada pie would be incredible, or let's do something with breakfast cereal, or let's do something, we can finally do something with figs now. Um, And I think it's, it, it was, it worked out really well. Oh, that's great. I, well, it's, it certainly certainly shows all this collaboration. So I was kind of taken by the story on your first date. Are you celebrating <laughs> 10 years of marriage this year? It will be 10, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Congratulations. 10 years, 10 years that's, to, that's fantastic. Sorry, 10, 10 years is a couple, five years married. Five years married. Okay, so I, I, I noticed that on your first date, it said that you, you got together and baked and you did the Scarlet Empress from, the, from uh, Rose Levy Birnbaum's The Cake Bible. So I, I went to my cookbook collection and pulled it out, and I'm looking at the recipe now, and I thought, well, you guys must have had a very good feeling about this first date because it says it must be <laughs> assembled eight hours to three days ahead. So you must have thought, well, this is going to work out pretty good. We had a lot of time here. It's a good way to, f- to flesh out a relationship, I think, <laughs> is if you could, you know, it's like, well, you're going to be stuck on the phone with me for six hours, so <laughs> let's get it all out now. <laughs> now that, and that's a pretty involved recipe. You weren't making, you know, chocolate chip cookies here. No, in fact, so you know, Chris was still in Pittsburgh, and I was in Atlanta when we had this idea to to have a date over the phone by making something. So I had suggested it, and I I threw it to Chris and said, "Well, you pick something." And what I was imagining he would do would be you know, something like you know a pound cake or you know, just right. something a little bit. Yeah, and and then he he threw that back at me. I said, "Okay, all right, let's this is uh, let's do it." That's a good test of a relationship, <laughs> isn't it? I really appreciate you taking the time to to talk to me today. Oh, absolutely. I, I hope you have fun baking. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good luck with the cookbook. It's a, it's a winner, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was our contributor, Janet Keeler, with Chris Taylor and Paul Arguin. Their cookbook is The New Pie, Modern Techniques for the Classic American Dessert. You can find a recipe for Chris and Paul's Hunky Monkey Peanut Pie on our website, thezestpodcast.com. Indulging in treats while helping a good cause 
That sounds like a win-win, and that's the idea behind Donation. That's D-O-U-G-H. The downtown Tampa cookie dough and ice cream shop is owned and operated by Metropolitan Ministries, an organization that provides food, housing, and other services for Tampa Bay residents in need. Donation's chef, Cliff Barcy, stopped by our studios to chat with producer Dalia Cologne about the popularity of social enterprise restaurants and to clear up some myths about eating unbaked cookie dough. So what is Donation? And that's D-O-U-G-H, Nation. Donation is a edible uh, cookie dough, ice cream, and desserts restaurant that's uh, really caught us by surprise. But the most important thing, it's a social enterprise. So all the money, we're owned and operated by Metropolitan Ministries. We're not just a business that gives a percentage of sales to a nonprofit or to a cause. So that's the difference. And we also have a culinary school that does job training. So when and how did all of this get started? It happened through a a partnership with Bob Basham, who's one of our long-standing board members, and he's one of the founders of Outback. He's now the creator of PDQ and uh, Glory Days. So he had a location down there that we're at. He owned it, and uh, they tested out some concepts there, and then then we made it one of our inside-the-box locations, and then we moved that location to Armature Works. So uh, we're... Tim Marks and I, our, our CEO, met with Bob and said, hey, we're going to close down ITB. And, and Bob's like, well, let's put something else there. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, what do you have in mind? And Bob's like, well, my son went to this place in New York called Dough that had edible cookie dough and they're killing it. He goes, you know, maybe you could create some cookie dough. So I created this cookie dough that's edible and it's edible because it's made with pasteurized um, eggs. I was going to ask you because our mommies always told us not yeah. to eat Yeah, it's raw pasteurized eggs. eggs. But the biggest thing is people don't realize it's the flour that was the issue. Like Nestle's has those refrigerated ones in the store, the pre-made that you just put in the oven. And, you know, they say don't eat it and people, you know, don't listen. So they were getting sick from it and they couldn't figure it out because they had pasteurized eggs. But it was the flour. Flour is a raw ingredient. You know, they they – they harvest it and they grind it and, and they make flour and then everyone uses that raw ingredient to cook things. Well, they weren't cooking it, so it has the possibility to have bacteria in it. So they create it um, with their flour company, a heat-treated flour. So it goes through a, a heating process at a low heat at a s- certain amount of time that uh, kills off the bacteria. So it's a special flour, pasteurized eggs, that makes it safe to eat. Okay, so we can eat it guilt-free. You can, you can, <laughs> you can eat it really guilt-free. We say because you know all the proceeds go back to help those in need in the Tampa Bay area. So, what's what's your background in food? Did you ever imagine you would be like the cookie dough guy? No, I came up with a recipe, but we have a cookie dough queen that sh- Christiana. She's the one who bangs all this out, and I'm sure it's uh, we've tweaked it a little bit with her help. She's a pastry chef. Interesting story. She was a resident, moved down here, dealt with some uh, issues, and ended up homeless with her daughter and moved in. And then she did some catering with us. And that's when I saw a resume that she went to pastry school in Chicago. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have to hire you. So now she's uh, she actually heads up her whole catering department now. Cookie Dough Queen would be the best business card the of all best, time. I know. Why do you think these social enterprise restaurants are – thriving right now? You know, one thing we learn right off the bat is we're just like any other restaurant. We have to have good service. We have to have a good food product. We have to have cleanliness and and all that. So, you know, that's what we pride ourselves on. We do a lot from scratch because we want our culinary students to learn how to make it from scratch, not to just open cans and pre-mixes and that. So uh, that's the success for us is that we have to compete, we have to market, just like any other restaurant. Our catering is different because companies enjoy the the philanthropic side of, we're having lunch, let's help someone at the same time. So they get that side of it more, and it, that's nice to see too. And we're blessed by all the nonprofits in the area use us for their catering. So it's, it's uh, nice to have that 
as well. So the product has to be good or people wouldn't come back. And I'm staring here. You yeah. brought some samples. And these are huge scoops. They look like scoops of ice cream. So talk to me about how this product is served. When you're baking cookies at home, you might lick the spoon. But this is this is like a whole this, meal in itself. This is yeah, this is a, probably a take-home share with a bunch of people type size cup. These are medium cups. Usually if people are using medium, they're sharing. But we also have a great line of uh, high-end ice cream we get out of uh, Sarasota, actually. And uh, I like it with cookie dough and ice cream. So usually when you order like a small cup, you get two flavors. So most people do one cookie dough, one ice cream. As it gets up, you get more flavors together. So... What are some of the most popular flavors? What did you bring today? Chocolate chip is always number one. We have sugar cookie here, which is also close second. For some reason, they didn't give you the dark chocolate, uh, double chocolate Oreo. Oh, that's right. Yeah. At my alley. Tell I me, know. Tell me where Donation is located so I can swing by on my way home. We are at uh, 505 North Tampa Street, right in downtown Tampa. So you're having so, a hard day at the office and you just need a little yeah. pick me up. So yeah, you'll get a workout find in a parking spot too. <laughs> and so, then you burn the calories yeah, and then you Yeah, you'll you'll, you'll them. park like a mile away and then you'll walk, so you'll burn Perfect. up all the it's calories. It's a workout and a snack. Yes. Okay, so we've got uh the chocolate, chocolate chip, chip sugar. The sugar with the sprinkles. This is peanut butter fluff with um Reese's pieces in it. My mouth is watering and I and just had breakfast. And this is s'mores, so it has um, chocolate, um, graham cracker, and marshmallow. Oh, my gosh. So Okay, we have to try these. I know you brought spoons, and our engineer, Richard, is in the sound booth just drooling. So, Richard, come on in here, and, and it's kind of like drinking alone. I can't eat this alone. <laughs> <laughs> so if something happens with the sound, it's not Richard's fault now. He's coming. <laughs> He's leaving the sound room. Okay. All right, so which one am I trying? What do you want? I'm going to try the chocolate chip. Oh, my gosh. This is so much. I know you said it's to share, but I could picture myself after my kids go to bed, me and Netflix and just this this big old bowl of cookie dough. Okay, so Richard, give me your feedback on the chocolate chip. Yeah, it's about, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's everything he says it is. It's delicious. This is dangerous. You so need, dangerous. You can eat a lot of this. All right, Richard, we'll polish off the rest of this later. Don't tell the rest of the staff so we no, can just keep this between us. All right, I think I've tried all the flavors now. It's so good. It tastes homemade. But the cool thing about ours, which a lot of the different companies or the stuff you buy in the store, other than like a Nestle product, um, it you can take it home and scoop this on a pan and bake it. It has the instructions right on the container. Oh, you can bake yeah, it? Yeah, so it's real cookie dough. Some of them don't use eggs. Some of them, you know, don't put the leavening in it to, to make it rise in that. It's more of a dessert that tastes like cookie dough. Um, but this is real cookie dough. I can feel my jeans getting tighter as we talk. <laughs> Chef Cliff Barcy, thank you so much for sweetening our day. And uh, I'm going to polish this off and then maybe hit the gym. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's great being here. I appreciate it. That was producer Delia Colon speaking with Cliff Barcy about Donation, a dessert restaurant that's owned and operated by Tampa's Metropolitan Ministries. Metropolitan Ministries also runs Inside the Box, a social enterprise cafe and catering business. Well, that's it for today. You can find us on Facebook or Instagram at The Zest Podcast. Visit us at thezestpodcast.com for recipes and stories that you might have missed. Last week, we got some grilling tips from Los Angeles restaurateur Josiah Citron, and we learned to make some summer cocktails with bourbon. It's right there in the list of programs. Be sure to subscribe to The Zest on our website or on your favorite podcast app. I'm Robin Sussingham. Dalia Cologne and I produce The Zest with help from Craig George, Mark Hayes, and Megan Trimble. The Zest is a production of WUSF Public Media.